Mmm. Delicious. Delicious Pete's Major Dickinson's Blend. Good morning, good people. What's up? Hope you're having a, uh, a good Sunday so far. Robert, Robert Gandy's in the house. Just you and me, Robert. What's going on? What's happening this morning? Fill me in. Seems like it's working okay. Pretty good this morning. I hope I didn't screw anything up. I hooked up a mic, made sure the audio was cool. You guys can hear me, right? We got the UK in the house. And we got Nicholas here. He says, hey man, love you. Love you too, Nicholas. Cheers, good morning. Uh, Ahos here from Denmark, that's awesome. Jennifer says, King's X kicked ass. Jennifer, did you go to the uh, the gig last night by any chance at the Canyon Club? I heard Doug maybe got a little overheated or, so, or something like that. I went on Wednesday. Friedman's here. Good morning, Dave. Uh, can you tell me uh, your favorite Sir guitar? These days, it's my blue one. The uh, It's right here. This one. I love it. I play this thing. This is pretty much my favorite guitar right now. I play this guy all the time. And I love, love, love it. Primarily, it, I mean, my other ones that are similar, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. My other ones that are similar sound, uh, sound and play great, but this one stays in tune so good because I've got that bridge on it and stuff like that. Um, the other ones stay in tune good too, but this one's just like stays in tune like a Floyd Rose, so it's really fun. Uh... Hey, from Poland and Seattle. Awesome to see all you here. Chris K says, what made you pick two humbuckers and not hum single hum for your signature guitar? I don't know. Um, I guess just because I'm used to playing, to some degree, Gibson style guitars. So, um, you know, the, the double humbucker thing, just I like the look and I like the feel and I like not having that extra single coil in the middle there. It feels like a lot of pickups to me, having the three pickups with the humbuckers, even though it's like a Strat's got three, I know, but... Something about having all that real estate full of pickups or whatever is... I've just... I've never really played Hum Single Hum. I don't think I've ever owned one, to tell you the truth. Um, the Hum Single Hum thing. And we've got Sweden here. It's evening in Sweden. And what am I going to do? Another Amps in the Zone. I'd like to do a Vox one, but to tell you the truth, I'm so busy this month. I don't know if I'll get to one this month because I'm finishing the record. I'm almost done. <laughs> got to be out in like a month, so i got to get it done but I'm making great progress. Uh, and uh, then I'm, I gotta go to Japan and stuff for some gigs, so. Uh, what did I do to get through plateaus once I'd reached an advanced intermediate level? I still feel like I'm at an intermediate slash ad intermediate advanced level. <laughs> like I already, like I plateaued there. I don't know, uh, what can you do? Um, Tackle a completely different style of guitar, maybe, you know? Um, you know, buy some, like, Albert Lee instructional books or something and tackle some crazy country stuff or uh, just try and stretch a little bit. Um, do something a little bit outside of what you would normally do. Pick up a classical guitar or something and start learning some of that. Just get some different stuff going in your, you know, to, to mix it up a little bit. Uh, that can be a good thing to do. Uh... Jennifer says you really got in there in that crowd at the whiskey. Yeah, I was right up front. It was great. Um, King's X. I'm talking King's X. It was a really, really terrific uh, show. It really was. Uh, I love that band so much. Uh, King's X played all over L.A. area this week. I think they played Canyon Club last night. They were at St. Rock in Hermosa Beach. And, you know, played clubs, like, all over t town while they were on tour. So it was, you had, like, three or four chances to see them in the kind of general L.A. vicinity this week. And they're, they're such a, an amazing band, really. Uh, let's see here. L says, I finally figured out how to get my Apollo Twin hooked up. Was doing some recording last night. It's amazing. Thanks so much for the recommendation. You bet. It is a really great interface. And you realize... Speaking of which, I did a little bit of recording with it this with this week, and Dave's here. I used his Friedman Brainworks 
BE100 plugin amp. And I actually used it in conjunction with some Celestian IRs. So I loaded up Celestian impulse responses in Logic and turned off the cab sim in the plugin. But I tracked through the plugin, it sounds amazing. It, it's, it's great. I did it for a part on the record, and it's like, that sounds perfect. I'm not going to redo that with a real amp or anything. So stuff's really amazing. Uh, the, the UA uh, UA interfaces and plugins, or all the plugins that are available for them, are just fantastic. Um, such great tools. And the other thing is they're rock solid. That's one thing I love about them. There's, they never screw up, or there's never like, oh, I need to reboot, or any of that stuff going on. They just work really well. Uh, any advice on beginning transcribing? I want to figure out blues tunes by Steve Ray Vaughan and Robin Ford and often struggle with trying to figure out how to play what I hear. Get, uh, uh, that's from Vibhas. Uh, get a, um, sorry, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, get a, a good phrase trainer uh, program. I use Transcribe from 7th String Software. It's about 50 bucks and it uh, works really, really well you can slow things down and you can, um, there's an EQ in it, so you can EQ out the bass and just try and isolate the guitar a bit. Um, you can uh, loop sections and stuff, which is really, really helpful. So you need a good phrase trainer like that. I think Riff Station is another one. There's a few out there uh, that you can get. And that'll be really helpful for you. Uh, it just helps to, to have a good, something good that'll play the, the stuff where you can loop things and you know hone in on parts really closely. And the only way I can say it is like just take very small bits of music at a time. That's the best thing to do. Like sometimes a bar or two will take you 10 or 15 or 20 minutes or half an hour to figure out. You might spend, you know, 45 minutes learning four bars of music. Um, if it's a complex passage or something like that, or you're really trying to hear a chord progression and nail it. But after a while, your ear just sort of gets used to it. Um, it's just through practice, really. You get better at it. Uh, Leon says, uh, just wondering what you need to reset up a guitar if changing pickups. Um, well, you don't really need to do that much to tell you the truth. You, just, you can take the strings off and, and then just it's easier to get at the pickups that way. And then when you put the new pickups in, nothing else should have changed in theory, like, you know, intonation wise. or So you shouldn't need to do that much, really. Just put in the new pickups and then you got to sort of once, you know, I don't do my own pickup changes because I'm terrible at soldering. Dave Friedman can attest to that I shouldn't have a soldering iron in my hand or basically any tools of any sort. <laughs> He's given me a real bad complex about it. <laughs> but I'm not, I, I just like like leave that stuff up to other people. But if you can handle a soldering iron and stuff, I'm sure there's probably some great tutorials on YouTube about how to you know change pickups and solder correctly and stuff like that. And just be careful. And uh, once you get the new pickups in, then you just kind of have to play with the pickup heights. So get the guitar, you know, get it strung up again and stuff like that, tune it up and then try and mess around. There's a good Joe Walsh tutorial on YouTube about how he sets pickup height. I think it's really cool. He, he talks about it using a clean tone. It's exactly what I think you should do. Use a clean tone and kind of really listen to the tone of the pickups and change from pickup to pickup, listen to the volumes. And, you know, he talks about, I think he's doing it on a Les Paul or something. He says, see, that's a little boomy on this side now. So you need to lower the bass side and you know, he kind of talks about that, about angling the pickups at just the right height and how he kind of dials it in. It's pretty cool. So check that out. Uh, and uh, what model is it, says uh, M. Mika Ballistic. Uh, I think you're talking about my Sur guitar. It's the it's my Pete Thorne signature guitar. This is the blue one that I just showed you. Um, and Ken Whistler here learned the Dirty Laundry solo somewhat. Couldn't get Joe's idiosyncrasies, so I threw in my own. Uh, it is a weird solo. You know, the Dirty Laundry solo is like, uh, I don't know if you can hear this. That's the first lick. And it's... Right? So it's like that. So it's like all these um, kind of, uh, you know, diminished sort of tritone sort of sounding. You know, it's a really, really cool lick, the way to start. So, and I do that a lot, actually, that little. If you're trying to put, throw in something between two shapes in a solo, you know, it's, so you're playing the octave on the outside and then the flat fifth. 
you know so if you're like you know say you're in an E position then you want to just you can use it as a little weird you know just sounds like you're playing outside for a minute or something and that's a total Joe Walsh thing. He did it a lot, actually. He's got a few kind of signature licks. The other one is the, you know, um, kind of that sort of thing where he, he does the bend and then the chromatic climb up, kind of like he does in Hotel California. He plays that a lot. He's got a, a, few, a few real cool signature things that you hear him do. He's a great guitar player. I love the way Joe... He plays with so much intention and never too fast or anything. It's very, like, you know, just really, really cool... There's a lot of humor in his playing. I think he's, he's just great. Uh, what channel on the PT-100 does the Van Halen plexitone? Well, the dirty side, you know, channel two or three and do that and you set it up. Um, the best sort of Van Halen-y sound I get out of that amp uh, is like the closest thing would be the channel two and get the volume up a bit so it's working and run the gain on maybe six or seven or something like that on the amp, on the channel two or three. You know, because they're the same. Two and three are the same. They're just two gains, two masters. So you can get two different levels of drive. Um, and try setting the tone controls like uh, with the bass and mids on about four and then the treble control, play with it between six and seven, something like that. And on the back, set the presence fairly like on about six or 6.5. And then try the feedback control below half at like three. It, 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 it's not, you know, maybe accurately the way that he had the negative feedback on his amp, but it just helps the tone of that amp to kind of dial in. If you dial it down a bit from five, I find, it sort of gives a little bit more um, of, a, of that feel or whatever, for whatever reason. It can sound pretty good for that tone. Uh... Let's see. Greetings from Johannesburg, South Africa. Wow. Far away. Uh, I've been there once. I played there once. Real interesting trip. I was in South Africa for a few days. Uh, Jennifer Singh, I'll shoot my friend a message about the show last night, see something is up with Doug. Yeah, I heard Doug just had a little bit of an overheating. He was a little dehydrated last night, I think. I don't know exactly what happened, but I guess he... He had to take a little break or something from me. I'm not, I don't know exactly what happened, so I'm trying to figure it out. But he mentioned that on, uh, on Instagram last night. Uh, let's see here. Morning from Pittsburgh, says Michael. Okay, moving down through the chat here. Christian says, have you tried the Revival Drive with IRs? I'm thinking of getting one for recording. Yeah, I think it would work really well for that. Um, I didn't try it specifically with, well, I guess I've tried it with IRs, just not directly into, you know, some of the demo that I did was here at, at home and I was using it through the aux and my amp and that was IRs for speaker sim. So if you just eliminate the amp portion, it should sound really similar to what you heard in the Plexi comparison uh, on the video. You know, I was comparing it to a real Marshall. Um, we're talking about the revival drive here from, it's over there, but I'm not going to get it, it's too far away, uh, from Origin Effects, and it does a great kind of Marshall Plexi thing, even into a power amp, it's a pedal, but you know, you can plug it right into a solid state power amp, and it actually, I was able to dial in the tone pretty close to my Marshall, uh, through the same cabinet, you know, I could match volume matching them and stuff, I was able to get the pedal sounding really, really close uh, to, to the way the amp sounded, it wasn't quite as big and bold and open sounding, but it was a good facsimile of that sound. A reasonable facsimile, as they say. Uh, alrighty. Uh, Andre's uh, in the house here from Costa Rica. I love Costa Rica, man. I have been there. Uh, I went out kind of by Tenerife, Playa Negra. I spent about a week out there. Uh, really beautiful, awesome, secluded. And uh, I, had a, I had a really good time, actually, on that trip. Uh, Han says, do I have any tips on how to mic an open back cabinet? Well, um, you can put a mic in the front and then you can put a mic kind of anywhere in the back. You'll have to flip the phase on the back mic. That's a really important thing. So because you've got the two mics pointing um, at the cabinet in different directions and one's going this way and the other one's going this way and the speaker's moving, you know, both ways. So this one, you'll have to flip the phase or you're going to have out of phase sound. 
and then beyond that just kind of dialing in for the best you know it's in the back so it's like it's kind of a weird place to put a microphone as far as like you're not you can't point it right at the center of the speaker or anything it's in you know but um you might want to try and put it kind of somewhat equidistant it's it's there's going to be some phasing stuff going on no matter what when you put a mic in the back but you have to flip the phase and then that'll get it closer to being in phase and and you kind of don't you you want to blend that sound not as hot i don't think i mean there's no hard and fast rule but blend it not as hot as uh as the close mic on the front um here's an interesting thing um there's this great sound guy uh named tom who's he's actually doing sound for don henley now i think um and maybe the maybe eagles part-time but anyway he uh he's a, a old friend of mine and he uh uh, as a young guy from England, he was he's done sound for like uh, Snow Patrol and Image and Heap and all kinds of cool artists, and he d he's really amazing. Like going to his shows, he the mix just sounds always incredible. He's a very modern kind of mixer. He mixes on a you know digital console and stuff, and he really mixes and he uses plugins and knows how to really get some great sound. So I went to see a band called Group Love that he was mixing, and it was at the Wiltern in L.A. And the guitar sounded awesome. And I was like, man, what are you doing on the guitar? Like, what is happening? It just sounded really great in the PA. And it was such an interesting rig. The guy uses <clears throat> a couple of, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of Blues Juniors, I think. And, uh, or maybe one Blues Junior was in, and the other one was a backup. So it's just a little amp. And he had a mic on the front and a mic on the back. And he would hard pan them in the PA and not flip the face. And it sounded like, it wasn't, I mean, it was kind of like a faux sort of stereo thing, I guess. I don't know. But because they're out of phase, if you were to blend them together up the center, it would be weird. It would be, you know, phasing and strange. But he would pan them in the PA, and it sounded amazing. It was like a really great live guitar sound. I thought, God, I've never heard of anybody doing that before. Mic in the front, mic in the back, don't flip the phase, hard pan. So if anybody has a stereo PA and they mic up a combo, give it a try and see if it sounds cool. I thought it was a really great tone and a cool trick. <clears throat> L says the screen froze. I don't know if we're gonna be able to help here, but you can uh, you can just uh, reboot the, the the chat window or the, the screen. You know, reboot the the window in your browser should come back. Uh, let's see here. Shawery uh, says, "How was the origin revival revival drive for you?" Abetted Petty John. I'm not sure what that means but I think you're asking compared to the Petty John the Petty John's more of a um, kind of a uh, like a regular overdrive pedal whereas the other one's more of a preamp like a full-on guitar preamp you know you know the Petty John you're not going to use as like into a power amp or something like that or and it doesn't have all, all those tone shaping options it's more of a like a uh, you know like you would use a traditional that, that revival drive is really kind of unlike it really is like almost like having a preamp uh, I would say. Uh, Spider says, how are the Japanese language lessons coming? Really good. Really good. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm learning. Uh, all right, I'll show you guys what I've been doing. Um, I've got this app that basically, <clears throat> it's like this, and it shows you characters. And so I've learned hiragana, basically, which is one of the three Japanese alphabets. And it just gives you a bunch of these. So let's see. Nah, looks like this. See that? And I have to draw the characters. Um, and it, it just kind of prompts you and asks you for for different, you know. And I've gone all the way through all these lessons here and learned all this stuff. So I've got the, uh, I've got hiragana. So I can kind of read now, which is amazing. Uh, and then, you know, I'm getting better at like stringing sentences together and stuff like that. So it's it's good. I do it every morning, yeah. Uh, Mayasa, you say, every morning. Every morning, I think you'll stay studying. Uh, Billy says, I like your playing. Thanks, Billy. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Leon says, if I was doing wet dry with two H9s, would I need a mixer? Yeah, yeah, I used to have a mixer for doing that. Sir Mini Mix, yes, you could use a Sir Mini Mix. I believe I believe the Sir Mini Mix has uh, two ins and outs on it, two sets of ins and outs, so that you can do you can turn your series loop into kind of a parallel loop and then have two effects devices. And yeah, that would work. That would work fine, right, Dave? 
I think so. Uh, totally possible. So you could have like, for, for example, reverb and delay both in parallel. Uh, can I talk about how to become more musical? Um, phrasing and listening to players that are really melodic, like Jeff Beck, David Gilmore would be too great. You know, listen to their solos and how they, um, how they phrase and almost speak through the guitar. I saw a great B.B. King video the other day, uh, where he's talking about, he's just soloing on a simple chord progression and he says, and it's kind of a guitar lesson where he's sitting there with another guy and he's playing, he goes, see, I'm feel, I feel like I'm talking to you now. And he was playing and, and that's what it did sound like, like he was singing through the guitar and BB always sounds like that, you know, where it's like he's, he sings the same way that he plays. If you notice, like when he sings and then he takes a solo and then he sings, it's, he's, the phrasing's the same. It's, it's amazing, you know, and that's really, it's so simple yet, yet it's amazing. I think many times guitar players get too caught up in the technique or learning a lick and then executing it and playing this stuff, which is really cool sometimes, but it's like when you're doing that, you're not really connected to like some sort of inner uh, improvising, singing, emotional voice, right? You're executing a learned thing. I do a lot of that too. Um, but when you hear the guitar players that really sound like vocal on the guitar, which translates to musical to me. Uh, they're really tuned into the, the phrasing and the singing, the improvising and the whole, like, you know, it's like they're speaking or singing through the guitar. Uh, did you ever do the push-pull bright cap mod on the 50 watt plexi? No, Dave actually put a different bright cap in the amp for me that's much more subtle. Uh, and it sounds great now. <clears throat> he, just, he just put a value in there. Maybe Dave can list the value that he put in in the chat here. Uh, because you're saying you just pick up a 1987X with that. Oh, you, you have, okay, you say that you've got that mod as well with the post-phase inverter master and the treble and normal channels internally hand-wired, way more usable. Yeah, that's cool. I, I find, you know, just with the bright cap value that Dave put in, it sounds great now, it's fine. And I can kind of, if I need to tame it a bit, I'll just turn the presence down or whatever a little. Uh, but it, it, it's, uh, it seems good now. What's my favorite Marshall in a box? Well, it kind of depends. Um, the, uh, the, the, the few that come to mind, um, Dave's pedal, the BEOD is great for the modded sort of Marshall thing, uh, the kind of more high gain, like his BE sound. I think that the Lagrange from Bogner is really good. Uh, I did a video on that. It's a, it's a great, probably my fav favorite Bogner pedal. Um, it does a great, great, you know, sort of plexi through, through 80s kind of tones. Uh, the the Revival Drive is terrific. Um, it's awesome too, the one I did this week. Uh, the the Petty John pedal sounded great for kind of a JTM 45 type tone. Uh, I thought it was really good for that. It's a little softer, kind of more like a you know softer overdrive sound, but it sounds really cool. It's fat. Um, and what was the other one? The uh, God, I always forget the name of that damn pedal. The the uh, Ramble FX Marvel Drive, really nice one for for the uh, the plexi thing. So out of all of those, I mean, plexi tones really good too for kind of the modded thing. Um, and some good options there. And uh, <clears throat> Jerry says, any idea when the CD's coming out? Well, I got it. It's like this month. Um, I think we have to deliver the digital download on June 1st, uh, and you're saying you ordered the CDs, so I mean, I'm just finishing up a couple things, literally, over the next uh, few days, so, so let's say by the end of next week, th the thing's gotta be finished, you know, so I really have to f hurry, hurry up this week and get it done, um, so I'll be working really hard on it. So yeah, basically within the next month. Um, sorry it's taken a while, but I just wanna make sure I've got, you know, 10 really good songs on there, and, and it's, I'm loving it, by the way. I'm really, really pleased with the way it's coming out. So, uh, so let's see here. So it looks like there's an imposter in the uh, in the uh, thing here. Somebody's taking a picture of me, and it says Pete Thorne, but that's not me typing. Your show sucks, Benny. It says. <laughs> So maybe there's a trolley troll in here. So somebody go report it, maybe, if you would. Because I don't have time for such things. Be my moderator, folks. 
Uh, and it's I've slipped way down through the chat here. So I'm going to go back and figure out where I was. Sorry. Just one sec. Uh, yeah, I've gotten way too far behind as usual, right? Just trying to figure out where I was. Sorry, guys. One sec. Uh, <clears throat> so Christopher says, just put Flish Fishman Fluent pickups in a telly. Can't believe how good it sounds. I've heard great things about those pickups, too. I haven't tried them, but I've heard really nothing but good things. Uh, and let's see here. Do I like neck through style guitars? Not really. Uh, I've only had a couple in my life, and I don't really. Th and they're just not that popular, are they? You don't see that many neck through guitars. I mean, there's a few out there, but I guess sort of the Firebird being the original, right? Uh, do I hear a difference between nickel and solid state frets? You know, I put solid state frets in a Les Paul once and I wasn't really crazy about it. It did kind of change. I don't know if it changed the sound through an amp, but I could hear it acoustically and it always bothered me a little bit. Uh, but on the guitars, my Sir guitars all have solid state frets. So if a guitar starts out with solid state frets and maybe more on the sort of like the Fendery style guitars, it doesn't bug me. I just didn't like it on a Les Paul for whatever reason. But the, the advantages are huge to them, obviously. The, uh, you know last they last forever and stuff so uh not forever but 10 times as long as nickel frets that's for sure do you use your distressor i've seen in your rack much it's actually friedman's distressor he lent me his and i was using it mainly to record some vocals uh for a record and i haven't actually used it uh, uh beyond that so it's just sitting in there in my room and um but it's cool. I, you know, this is, actually, since I started using it, some great plugins came out. Like uh, Slate came out with their version of the Distressor, and there's also the UA official version now, and they both work great. So I tend to just because of workflow and trying to get things done fast. If I can do it with a plugin and it sounds good to me, I do it. Uh, all right. Let's see here. Any suggestions on MIDI controller overdrives? MIDI controllable overdrives. The only one that I really can think of is that one that I did a while ago. What the hell was it called? It's a great big white pedal with, uh, uh, you know, numeric display on it. What the heck is that thing called? Maybe somebody will mention it in the chat here. Uh, I'm not going to remember the name of it right now, but it was a MIDI controllable overdrive with, and it sounds great. It is really good. It's quite big. I mean, it's like this big, um, but did everything from Kalani stuff to Tube Screamers to amp sort of distortion and it was really good quite good um i'll have to find the name of it and maybe post it in the in the comments below or something uh what do i think about the m160 it's good uh m160 sounds great really great sounding ribbon mic for a reasonable price it's a little darker sounding than um than some others so it, uh there's been a nice development with ribbon microphones uh in the last few years which is active ribbons um like the Royer uh, 122 is an active ribbon. I believe it's tube as well, um, I think. But So that means it's got a preamp built in. And something about having the preamp in the microphone, what I've found is that uh, you get a more extended top end and they can sound like really good by themselves. Whereas usually with like the old Royer 121 and stuff, it sounds pretty good for some sounds, especially clean stuff that you want a little more mellow and just really natural. But sometimes I miss that cut that you get from a 57. Um, so I feel like you got to blend it with another mic many times to get a good tone. Um, with the active ribbons, you don't have to do that. So the, the M160 is more traditional, old school. It's a little darker and stuff like that. So it can sound really good by itself as well. But sometimes you want that little bit more extended top end. So that's the only thing. Just know, probably with an M160, I would say you're going to want to maybe blend it, especially for rock tones, with, a, uh, with another microphone, like a 57 or something. Leon says, thanks for answering all these questions. You bet. Okay, I'll try and go faster, faster, faster. Uh, did I use two notes IR loader with the Buxom Betty? I've only tried the Buxom... Are, are you talking about the uh, plug-in for the Buxom Betty? I've only tried it once. Uh, and no, I didn't try the two notes IR loader with it. Uh, which is Wall of Sound, right? I haven't used Wall of Sound that much. I tend to use the uh, Mix IR2. And I use the Celestion impulse responses a lot in MixIR2. That's my main kind of impulse response scene. Uh, can I explain the difference between high and low cut pass? Or low cut or pass? 
and bass and treble controls? Um, well, sometimes uh, there they, sometimes there's some crossover there. For instance, here's the Petty John pedal, right? This is labeled highs and lows. This is a low cut and a high cut on this pedal. So sometimes on certain pedals, that's what they're doing. It's just closing down top end like a filter from like a certain point, like you know, like from 20k all the way down to 1k or something. It'll be designed to like cut top end, and then the low control will passively cut lows as you turn it down. Um, some EQ is what's called active, so you'll notice like if it's set in the middle and you bring it up, you get more highs. If you turn it down, you get a dramatic drop in highs, or if you, you know what I mean? And that, and that is, is like an active thing where it's actually boosting or cutting from the center detent. Um, so it's a couple different designs there. Um, yeah, there's all, there's all different kinds of, that's a very simplistic, like the difference between sort of passive cutting. Like on an old Marshall, the EQ is basically lossy, right? So it's like if everything's on 10, then that's the closest thing, I guess. Dave could just explain this better, but that would be the closest thing to having it kind of out of the way of the circuit. And then you're basically cutting stuff when you're turning down treble, bass, presence, whatever. Um, and then there's some amps that have more of the, well, if you even take like a, let's take the Mesa Boogie with the, with the, you know, graphic EQ. With the graphic, you're boosting and cutting frequencies. So you're, it's, that's the difference between like the active, active EQ and passive EQ. And I guess probably some amps have active EQ on pots too. Uh, let's see here. Is there a logistical or technical benefit to outboard distortion, reverb, or et cetera, FX through pedals versus built-in effects on an amplifier? Well, amp distortion to me um, is the most organic and the most it just feels that you know a distorted amp is a, like the whole amp's working in harmony and to to kind of do its thing and and sir says to me that a lot of it has to do with the high voltage and like you know you the, the, the type of dynamic range and you know stuff that you get out of like a tube preamp in an amplifier that is well designed that is distorting it's you know like there's whatever 250 volts on the tubes it's high voltage and it's very dynamic and very like you know touch sensitive and all that stuff Whereas when you're doing it in a pedal, you're kind of simulating that, and you're doing it, you know, with a nine or eighteen volt pedal, and at a much lower, you know, sort of, the, the, it's not the same. So, so you know, when you see pedals that are advertised as being amp-like and stuff, many times now they use those voltage doublers on the inside to double from nine to eighteen volts, and they're kind of like, uh, like the Sherlock pedal I did recently from Australia was a tube distortion that's high voltage you know you need this certain power supply for it and it's advertised as being kind of like very amp like because it's got this you know high voltage on the tubes and you're getting that and sure enough it it sounds you know a lot closer to the distortion in an amp so that would be the advantage i think just as well as like there's something about even preamps and power amps right where you've got like a tube preamp and then a tube guitar power amp and then them not being in the same box and I don't know what it is. Maybe Dave could chime in on that too. But there's something about an amp where everything is working in the same amplifier with the same power supply and all that stuff where it just kind of works in harmony and has a, the most sort of organic distortion character. And I'm not a tech, so I do a pretty shitty job of describing exactly why that is. But I'm sure we all feel it. You know, when you play a great old 50-watt Marshall or something like that and you roll the volumes up and down on the guitar and change pickups, it's just so dynamic and it's so... It just feels like a, like a unified thing or something. <coughs> Pedals can always feel just a little bit fake to me by comparison. And then you're asking about reverb and stuff. Reverb in an amp is, you know, it's, it's arguably, uh, I mean, spring reverb's cool, you know. It's got a, it's got a thing to it, but, you know, it's, I don't, I'm not as, like, married to using a, a spring reverb that's in an amp as I am to like I don't like it as much as the overdrive quality of amps or whatever I'm cool with using outward effects for things like reverb and delay and stuff like that nothing like an old cool tube spring reverb sound you know but uh, this is not something I use as much any plans on touring South America says Aaron not right now I'd love to go though again hopefully again someday man we'll have to make make it down there the best crowds in the world South America I really think so. Uh, Christopher says, I feel like things take me a long time with guitar. Me too, man. It's, it's, a, it's a long road sometimes, getting things under your fingers and practicing and stuff. 
Uh, let's see here. Uh, what else we got? That's a good question. I have a CAA OD50 Standard Plus into a Bogner oversized 212, and I'm interested in a Bella Combo. Is it redundant compared to the OD50 Clean? So I use, you know, PT Clean into a closed back cabinet quite a bit. I do like sometimes, um, I don't feel like it's redundant actually, no, having the Bella, because a Bella combo would be a great complement to your, it's a, it's smaller, it's easier to, to carry around. It's nice to have a 112 with an open back. The open back thing is the biggest difference to me. And an open back is still, for me, the coolest clean sounds. Having, an, having that spread of the amp kind of, it just sounds more, Spacious. I like closed back cabinets for dirty stuff, and I like open back cabinets for clean stuff, generally speaking. So I don't think it's redundant. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. And just the, just having a combo and you know the ability to have an amp that you could just tote around and use with pedals if you want. It's a little bit easier to carry than the big 212 in the head and all that. Um, it's it's nice to it's always nice to have a combo. I have very few of them, but I have a Bella in mine sitting right here. Uh, and I've been using it a lot lately, actually, for uh, for paddle demos and stuff. How much fret wear is too much? My 12-year-old Epiphone's frets have one third of the crown worn off. Well, yeah, it's probably time for a for a fret dress. Then I would say, when will string buzz get really bad? It's hard to say. You know, no two guitars are the same, or two players are the same. But um, I hate the feel of when frets get worn, and it's not. You know, I just love like new new big frets that are crowned really nicely. Um, it's just such a great thing. So it, it can be just kind of unpleasant playing on a guitar where the frets are really worn or pitted. It's just not as much fun. Uh, let's see here. Chris K says Fender has recommended heights for single, single, single guitars, which can be a nice place to start as well. Uh, I guess you're talking about just pickup heights. There's some Fender official recommendations. Uh, questions about tube rattle from John. Just got a sweet little Super Combo 1606, but the power tubes are rattling. Any advice? Uh, I don't know. It depends on the tubes. It, might, it could be maybe you just need to replace the power tubes. Sometimes like Stumac, they have things like the, you know, there's been different ways to like kind of like the old Marshalls had those spring-loaded things with the little hats kind of that went on the tubes to kind of hold them tighter. Maybe maybe there's something you can add, uh, you know, different tube sockets or something like that that have those kind of retainers on them. That might be helpful. You might want to hit up Supro and ask them if they recommend anything. Um, we've got 307 people online, that's not bad. Uh, have we come to the end of the road in terms of how much we can innovate tone in new pedals? If not, what's missing and has not already been created before? I asked this question at GitCon to a couple of people, both the TC folks and Robert Keeley, and they both kind of gave me the same answer, which is they're like, they're, uh, well, actually, it wasn't exactly the same, but Robert's answer was he likes to put different things, uh, combine effects into the same pedal. So I have one of his pedals here. Here's the DNM drive, right, for uh, the, the folks from the, uh, the that pedal show. And so he's, he's put two different sounding overdrives in one box here. So he's combined two very different drives in the same thing, which isn't totally revolutionary. It's a nice, very nice pedal, by the way. But, you know, he's, he's into things like combining a flanger and a delay into one pedal or a phaser and a tremolo in the same pedal and kind of combining effects to get, uh, uh, you know, move forward and get different sounds out of one pedal. And then with the TC guys... Um, they don't. This isn't a uh, uh, one of the new ones, but on the TC pedals, the Flashback Two and the Hall of Fame Two and stuff in the foot switch, they've got this mash thing where it basically once you turn the effect on, then you can push on the foot switch and it acts as an expression to control things in the pedal. I think that that's cool and innovative and allows you to get different sounds that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise um, out of the same old effects like delay or reverb. You're going to be able to get some different things going. You know, uh, you could do couple parameters like say when you stand on them 
the uh, the mash effect on the reverb. You could have the high end close down and have the reverb tail out or something. So it sounds like a filter closing, but the reverb getting big. I don't know. Like I'm just making stuff up, but you could you could do stuff like that. So uh, beyond that stuff, yeah, I think people are just kind of re reinventing the wheel a little bit. You know, taking I, it's not like there's been brand new effects. You know, a lot of them introduced since, say, the whammy. Or, but that's not, you know, Electro Harmonics keeps coming up with stuff. Like when I think about that Mel 9 pedal, which I actually think I might go buy. Um, the, it's like a uh, uh, Mellotron, it, you know, that sounds really cool um, in a pedal. Like kind of does a Mellotron thing on the guitar. So Mellotron flutes and choir and stuff. They've got all kinds of pedals like that. And their sitar pedal and, um, you know, they're doing kind of innovative, weird things with pedals, I think. Uh, okay, let's see here. I'm gonna go, try and go faster. Uh, Mehran Khan says, he knows I'm busy, but uh, missing my amps in the zone videos. Would love a high gain one. I'd like to do that too, yeah. Some high gain amps, classic high gain amps. I'd like to do it with a Soldano maybe, like a SLO 100. Um, take something kind of classic. Uh, and uh, I'll get to doing more. I just, I, with tackling finishing two records and, and then just kind of having to finish video demos for folks that are waiting on them, I just kind of sometimes run out of time. Uh, let's see here. James says, who can I mail my guitar to for refret? Um, depends on, you know, where you are in the country. Whereabouts are you located? Maybe I could recommend a shop or something. I don't I don't know a lot, but you know, there's some great places in Nashville. I can think of some in San Francisco as well as LA. Um, Grand Music Production says, didn't Steve Lukather play the second solo in Dirty Laundry? Yes, he did. That is Lukather, the first one's Joe Walsh. Uh, John says, nice to see you working more from home. Do you mostly use the aux these days for recording and videos? I've been using the aux a lot. Yeah, I have. Um, but I'm still loving my Sur Reactive Load and using it with the Celestian IRs. So that's still one of my favorite, favorite tones. Um, so I would say I like using both for the IR thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. How do you tighten a tele input jack? What tools are needed? Uh, I guess the best thing to do is just get, get at it from, you might wanna uh, remove the tele control plate the, where the controls are and then you can reach in from the bottom and hold the jack while you tighten the, the front side you know what I mean that would be helpful is being able to kind of get it at both sides of it and then if you were going to kind of half ass it you could probably use a uh, uh, a pair of pliers to tighten the thing or you know if you want to be careful to not damage the, the nut or anything that holds the output jack use a, uh, a proper <laughs> like a socket you know uh, do I have a personal opinion on who really wrote the Hotel California solo? I think uh, it was, I think it's pretty much known that it was Felder that like basically brought, he brought in a, a finished version of Hotel California, I believe. Like the, there was no melody or no, um, you know, lyrics or anything yet, but he had the song basically pretty much mapped out, I think, including guitar solos uh, that he had you know, played in the solo, solos were somewhat, I'm sure Joe kind of did his own thing, but there's a demo, I guess, of Felder, you know, playing most of the parts on the song uh, that he came up with. That's what I've heard anyway. Uh, Vincent says he's painting a guitar and watching Pete while sipping a Guinness. Happy Sunday. Have a good Sunday, man. Please. Desert Island guitar amp and pedal. I would say my PT Signature guitar and PT-100 in a delay pedal of some sort. I'd be fine with that. I could, I could probably do most of what I do with that setup, truth be told. Uh, having a little trouble dialing in the distortion tone on my new Mesa TC-50, any tips? I haven't tried that amp. Um, I don't know, it depends. What are you hearing that you don't like? I wonder, and I wonder what kind of speakers you're using and stuff like that, you know. Sometimes, what I find with distortion is that everything affects it so much, like the speakers are so, you know, like you can play a clean tone, you can try V30s or try greenbacks and go, huh, I kind of like both, like it sounds, 
you know, sounds pretty good through both. The V30s have a little more clarity or something, but I like things, you know. And then as soon as you hit the distortion, it's like, oh, I really prefer that one speaker for my sound or whatever, you know. The distortion really accentuates everything. You blow it up with distortion and compression, and, you know, then, then the speakers really matter and everything else starts to matter a lot. So it could be many variables that you're, you're not digging. Uh, see here, have you ever thought of doing a video specific, specifically on cabling methods? And McLean Classics is asking this. For various setups like stereo, wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, four cable. That'd be a cool video. Like kind of showing the different setups. I like that idea. Uh, everything from plugging straight into an amp to going four cable to going with two amps in stereo. What do they call that? Seven cable or something? Uh, and maybe a you know, the difference between series and parallel. That would be a good video, describing all that stuff. I'll think about that. Do I play any vintage guitars? I have a few. I have an old 335, an old Strat, and an old Tele, which I love. That's from Vintage and Rare. Uh, let's see here. Good thing I know the normal time, since YouTube seems to refuse to notify me, says L. Scott Music. Yeah, I'm not sure why. I have my YouTube verifications turned off generally just because I get so many very verifications in my life for different things. So I've never actually tried to turn them on and see when people are going live and stuff, but I'm not sure what the problem could be. Uh, Vesuvial says, uh, thanks for all your videos. Your info and amps has helped me find a sweet spot on my cheap ass half stack and improve my tone 100%. That's awesome. Happy to help. Uh, L says, how does the aux work with and complement the Apollo? More profiles, sounds, mic placements. The, um, the aux is just uh, really easy to use as far as the workflow goes with, let me see if I can open the app here. Uh, I think I might have to have the, uh, the aux on. One sec. I'll uh, set it up here just really quick and then I'll show you what I like about it. Um, the, the thing about the aux is that the workflow with the, it's just a, like an elegant, easy thing to use to, to get a bunch of different guitar sounds and to get them quickly. And then of course you can save them as presets. So it's like your different, you know, mic and cabinet favorite sounds, you know, oh, I like this open back sound with a little bit of reverb or whatever, you just store it. And then it's like it's in there and it's really, really easy to get back to. That's one of the things I really like about it. So uh, right here on this, I've got an iPad right here that's on a stand mounted. Uh, and it's just so easy to, to uh, you know, sit here with it. It's a right here beside me and I can just type on it and get to it really quickly. Okay, let's see here. So you can see the different... Uh, let me make sure you can see this on the screen. I'll just give you a quick demonstration here. Uh, looks like this, and then you've got your faders here for the different uh, microphones, two different close mics, and then a room microphone setting here. This is the cabinet section here, and you can go here and just easily select a different cabinet. If I wanted to try something else, I could just push this and switch to different speaker cabinets. There's controls here for on-axis or off-axis microphones, the off-axis will sound a little darker and a little warmer. If you want to take some edge off, just hit that off-axis switch and it tends to work. If you feel like it's a little boomy, there's a low cut there. You can just turn on and off the, the, low, the low cut for the different mics. These are pans. You can easily solo or mute microphones. And then with the effects, it's like, oh, I want some delay. Well, there you just call up the delay. Here you just call up the reverb. There's a, there's a plate reverb there. Here's a compressor. And here's an EQ. And so you can just really easily get in, add some simple delay or a little bit of modulation using the delay, um, add some reverb, blend in more or less. You know, it's just like this really, really easy thing to get around on. Like the world's easiest, simple multi-effect slash cabinet sim. <laughs> so they've done a nice job with that. And um, it, it's, it's like a nice workflow, you know? That, and that's what I really like about it. It's very simple to use. Um, and so it complements pretty much anything. It was just certainly works well with the, the Apollo. 
but it'll work well with pretty much any interface, I would think. Hi from Brantford, Ontario, home of Wayne Gretzky. That's right. Wayne came from out there and then went to Edmonton and made history. Uh, condenser mic on cabs. Sometimes, um, sometimes it depends on the microphone. I certainly do use that U67 in the uh, in the aux a lot, a simulated uh, condenser mic, and a lot of great recordings were done. In the 70s, a lot of people went to condensers on cabs. I think ACDC used U87s or 67s combined with maybe like 421 or 57 or something like that on a lot of stuff. Uh, and I know like Ken Scott is an engineer that used to use U87s on everything. He did everything from the Beatles through, uh, uh, you know, did uh, Aladdin Sane and all kinds of great David Bowie stuff. And he, I, I worked with him a little bit uh, 20 years ago and he, um, was into 87s on everything. That guy would use that, that microphone for just about everything. So I know he did a lot of stuff using condensers. It can be done and sound really good. They can be a little edgy depending. They can sound really great if they're, you know, just right. Oh, who is it? Uh, who's that great? It's uh, Wagner or whatever his name is. The, the uh, uh, so disrespectful, I can't remember his name, but he's done a ton of hard rock stuff. And he's in... Uh, uh, Nashville now. Anyway, I'm forgetting his name, but he's done a ton of stuff, and he, he uses a condenser microphone blended with a 57, I think, uh, on on heavily distorted guitars. Uh, just switched to 10.5 strings on my Sir Pro Standard. Says John, I think we'll have a nut issue with trem use because of the wider strings. Probably not with just like 10.5s. Um, I find even with the nuts on the Sir guitars, I still like to use a little Big Ben's nut sauce sometimes, or you can use that Diodario stuff. It's helpful. Um, you don't totally need it on this. It's it's minimal, but I still I just like to have a really 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 no no friction tension free nut situation on my guitars because I like to just stand in tune. So give a little dab of that a try, and you should be okay with 10.5s. I would think. I don't think you need to widen the nut unless you find it's binding. Uh, what version of the JHS Ang Angry Charlie do you prefer the most? I would say the, the Andy Timmons pedal, which is like a modified Angry Charlie. Uh, Randall says, thoughts on tube rattle? Oh, another question about tube rattle. Getting some ugly noise from tubes on low notes. Yeah, maybe try contacting some uh, company like... Uh, like Stumac or something, or one of those like, uh, maybe Mojo. Maybe they've got like a... A recommendation for tube rattle. Uh, Mojo, they sell like amp parts and stuff and tubes and um, you can contact them and see if they've maybe got the, like like I was saying on the old Marshalls and stuff, sometimes they'd use those retainers with springs and kind of little hat that went on the top of the power tubes and it would hold it. Uh, maybe it's something like that that you can somehow retrofit if you're having problems with, you know, unless it's just a certain set of tubes you've got that are giving you trouble. What time of day do you feel is my most productive in the morning, kind of around now? When I get up, have some coffee, and I get moving, uh, that's when I can do my best kind of work. Throughout kind of the day until early evening. And I'm actually not really a night person when it comes to recording and working. I, I, I just burn out by the evening, and then I'm not as creative, I find. Um, thoughts on Frank Zappa, especially his guitar playing. You know, Frank was some of the earliest stuff I listened to when I was like 10 years old was Zappa. Shut up and play your guitar, and you know, I remember like uh, "Ship Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch" had just come out, and so I was listening to that record, which is probably like not people's favorite Zappa record, but um, but so that was like an early influence on me. Um, but it's like kind of heady for me to tell you the truth. Like I, I mean, I appreciate it, and I love his wacky, kind of totally avant-garde thing. But but beyond that, those early years of listening to it initially, because it was so crazy and stuff, I I didn't really like get deep into it. As, as being like my favorite favorite music, you know. Um, am I going to be on next Sunday, says Christopher. Yes, I'll be here next Sunday. You bet, you bet. Cable recommendations. Um, for read readily available stuff, I use the Planet Waves quite a bit. Um, I, I use a lot of provenance cables, which may or not may not be easy to find in America. I'm not sure. They're definitely easy to find in Japan. Um, I really like the pro the tone of the Providence cables, and for kind of like a mid-priced cable, they're really great, I think. So I've got lots of those. Um, 
Uh, and let's see here. Uh, inexperience with boogies. Do I like them? That's from Brett. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I've owned a lot of Mesa amps. I had a 50 caliber, the original one with EL 84s in maybe 87 or 88. I bought that amp. I didn't have it long. I had problems with the tubes and I was stupid then because I was young. And so it was like, Oh, this amp sucks. I must get rid of it. But it actually sounded really good. That amp. Um, and, uh, but I traded it for a studio preamp and a 295 power amp. So then I got in this rack setup. I had a 12 space rack and two of the Mesa vertical 212s with a half open back. So I had those, but that was a lot of, like, I kind of wish I just stuck with that caliber 50 in one cabinet. It sounded really good. I know they, they had a reputation for sort of tube failure and over, I don't know if it was a design or what they had four EL 84s, but it was a cool, cool sounding amp and a real sweet gain sound to it is my memory of it. And it's funny because years later I was at uh, Chris Cornell's house when he had a house here in LA and he had one that was sitting in the corner. I'm like, you have one of those. And it's like, I went and looked at it and sure enough, it was the one with the EL EL84s and they only made it for about a year and then they switched over to 6L6s in that amp because I think they were having problems with the, the other tubes. And the 6L6 one didn't sound as good, but he had one that was the EL84 and he's like, yeah, it's a cool amp. And I'm like, I know. I'm like, I had one of these and he's like, yeah, there's nobody talks about it. And so we we bonded on this amplifier that that uh and it's weird because i'd never seen him use it or anything like that or, or you know but he, there it was sitting in his house and it's kind of an obscure amp so did i have any others i had a dual rectifier that i used so i was, I was in this band 40 foot echo for a while in the early 2000s and we put a record out and stuff and so if you if you listen to the 40 foot echo record which is on itunes and apple music and stuff i'm playing guitar on that record uh on everything and uh uh, that's the dual rectifier. It was a three-channel dual rectifier that I got for that. Everybody was using that amp around then, right? For, it was kind of like that modern hard rock band sound. And so I had one. And then I, I didn't take it on tour. I actually ended up taking a, I had the Randall uh, modular with the RT250 power amp and stuff. And that's what I used on the tour. But the record was the, the rectifier. So I've had a few few Mesa amps. I want to say that I had another that I, I'm forgetting right now, but... Uh, okay. Uh, Half says, I rem think I remember something about Johnny Lang loving the sound of the back of his amps. Yeah, it can sound really good blending in. You can experiment with it in like Wall of Sound or or using the Celestion IRs and it'll be perfectly in phase. That's the other thing. If you do it in IR land, they've, fa they've got them all so that the, they're phase locked and all that. And so they, it's great. But so you can go with a, an IR plugin and blend like say the Celestion. Oh wait, can you do it on Celestion? Do they have the back or is it just own hammer? I think it's only the own hammer. Celestion don't have back mics. I don't think, no, I can't remember right now. But anyway, own hammer has it for sure. And you can blend, you know, like on a, Open back 112 with an EV or whatever, you could put a front mic and a back mic and blend in that back mic and hear kind of the sound. And you'll hear probably why for blues or, you know, somebody like Johnny Lang, why they like it. It lends this real, um, it's kind of like, it sounds more natural. It sounds like the amp in the room a little more when you blend in the back mic just a little bit. It has a little more of this darker, fuller, blooming kind of thing that's really, really, really cool. Corinne says, do I like Stratocasters? I love Stratocasters. It's my first guitar design that I have, a copy, Stratocaster copy, but I fell in love with the whole thing, for sure. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Ted says, I've just bought an M-Audio Firewire audio interface for home recording and have Bear Dynamic flat EQ headphones. Can I help and tell you recommendations for basic home recording? Uh, get an external hard drive to record to, for sure. Um, beyond that, probably get one microphone, like a 57 or something, uh, and just dive in. I don't know, there's so many great tutorials and stuff like that online. Uh, but yeah, make sure you always record to an external drive. That would be one really good, you know, so your, your sessions are on a, on an external drive and you're not trying to drive the hell out of, uh, 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 the, you know, the, it's, it's really taxing to record basically to the system drive on your computer. Uh, okay, let's see here. 
What would be the advantage of bent steel saddles on a fixed bridge guitar? I currently have stainless steel modern blocks, but I have some bent steel. They sound a little different. Just try it. Uh, you know, set it up and try try the uh, the different saddles and see if you like the tone. It can change the sound a little bit. And some people like the old saddles. I do like the tone of the old saddles, actually. I don't even know how to describe it. But it, it does sound more vintage or something, unless like the sort of solid... It's a little more air or something. Um, that's the only way I can describe it. I use bent steel on my modern, you know, my Sir signature guitar and stuff has that. Sorry, not bent steel, they have the solid blocks. The bent steel I have on, like for instance, my white Sir with the traditional six screw strat style bridge on it. Uh, what essential UAD plugins would I recommend for the Apollo Twin? Just got myself one. Um, I would say like the the SSL is great to have for mixing, like get the channel strip or the API, they're both good, but get one of those two channel strips, uh, SSL E channel. Um, I use those all the time when I'm mixing because the EQ is kind of surgical and great and it's got a compressor built in that works well and then you can use it in the unison slot of your Apollo for, you know, as a mic pre. Um, so either the SSL or the API are nice to have for, for both for, for mixing and for, for tracking. So I would get that. I really love the SSL bus compressor. I use it all the time on Master Bus for just like a little bit of light compression and it just ha it makes it sound more like a record. So get that. Um, other ones I use all the time. The Millennia EQ is really, really nice for Master Bus. It's just this wonderful, sweet sounding plugin. Um, Oceanway Studios is incredible for like a natural kind of roomy reverb. It's a, you know, it's taxing on the CPU. Uh, uh, but it, it, it does sound like nothing else. It's a really great sound. Um, the uh, EMT plate reverb, as well as the the other, the the, the, uh, the two EMT verbs are are both incredible. Uh, the Space Echo, the Roland Space Echo, as well as the Roland, it's called something else now, I can't remember what it's called, but the Space Echo style plugin, as well as the Echoplex style plugin are really, really nice for tape delays. Neve 1073 is awesome. Uh, those are the main ones that I use a lot. You know, the, I think it comes with LA2A and 1176 already, right? So those are great for you know, LA2A is amazing to use on vocals, bass, sometimes acoustic guitar if you want a certain sound, and and then the 1176 is also invaluable. Uh, Distressor. It's amazing, you know, as a as a Swiss Army knife compressor. Uh, okay. Uh, wanting to get a P90 equipped guitar. Suggestions? Well, it depends what you want to do. You know, a good old uh, 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 SG Junior or something like that can be a great, you know, or Les Paul Junior, Les Paul Special. Um, and then there's all kinds of different, you know, Sir certainly makes tele styles with, with P90s that are, that are really fun and cool. Um, uh, you know, or like Fender Tellys that have, that have P90s can be great. I mean, the classic to me is always like the Les Paul Junior, Les Paul Special, SG Junior, SG Special. Would I ever want to live in Japan? Yeah, I could totally live there and, uh, and love it. Uh, it's a great place. I like the people a lot and just the culture in general and they love rock and roll and they love guitar. Any opinions on the Dirty Shirley Amp by Friedman? It's one of my favorites that Dave makes actually. It's great. Have I ever recorded with it or played it live? I haven't but I've played it a lot. Uh, I've plugged into them quite a few times and um, it's a great amp man. I mean both the low gain, don't discount the low gain stuff. Try turning the master way up and running the gain on like two. It's a great clean sounding amp. Uh, you know, for you can use it with pedals and stuff that way, and it's uh, it's really terrific. Uh, what's the latest on Gibson? I don't know. I haven't heard anything lately. Uh, Paul says my playing's been on fire since the new year. Thank you. I'm in, I'm enjoying playing. I don't. I feel like I don't play enough, but when I do, I'm really into it, and and I got to get this record out and you know hear what I've been trying to trying to do with that, and hope you like it. Maybe that's why, because I've been really excited about this record, and so I'm into, into it. So maybe I'm reinvigorated. 
Uh, Christopher says, I've always been influenced by the police and Andy Summers. Me too. Have I ever met him or played together? No, I'm kind of intimidated by him, actually. <laughs> I'm sure he's probably very nice. Uh, but uh, he, yeah, I, I love Andy. And he lives here, too. He lives in... I was supposed to do something a little while ago with him. I was hit up by... Oh, it was Fishman. And they were talking about... Probably not supposed to talk about it, but we were supposed to maybe make a video for their MIDI guitar. And it was going to be a few guitar players doing all playing together, and one of them was Andy, and I was going to do it. So I was like, "Oh wow, that sounds cool," uh, but I don't know if it didn't uh, didn't uh, come together. Jennifer says that Doug fainted. So this is last night at the King's X show. His text somehow caught him and c carried him behind the amp. Band played on for a few bars and then stopped. And the club was very hot, so I guess he got overheated. That's too bad. Uh, I hope he's okay. You know. Poor dude. Um, he was amazing the other night. I mean, when you look at that guy and you think, God, he's 67 years old. And he kills it. So I hope he's taking good care of himself and he's, he's feeling okay today. Uh, thoughts on the Celestion G1265 speaker? Like them, sort of. Um, especially the old ones in, in the 412s that they originally came in. I was talking about this with Dave the other day, actually. Um, like he was, Dave was saying he'd like to get an old 412 with the original 65s in it. They were cool sounding. A lot of you know early 80s stuff was recorded through those speakers because that, that's what they were coming in stock kind of in Marshall cabinets then. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Let's see here. Any gain pedals I recommend? I'm running a clean amp. So all drive tones comes from the floor. Looking for a carbal rig guitar and pedals. I mean, kind of the ones I mentioned earlier, the Marshall style pedals, like the either for the modded tone, the BE overdrive, or the maybe a Lagrange. The Riot is great. It's a little darker sounding, a little fuller. The Riot to me, it's a little less marshy, a little more like a modern gain sound, but it can. It, there's crossover there for sure. It's. I find it's a little fuller through the mids than some of the other Marshall pedals. That's all. Um, so that could work great, and then you can push it with either like a Klon or Tube Screamer style, Archer or a, you know, TS style pedal, uh, and between those two, you should you should be covered. Maybe those two and a uh, and a fuzz. Uh, okay, uh, let's see here. I know I'm so far behind, but that's just always the way it is, isn't it? What humbucker should I replace? My Squire Strat humbucker two. Uh, it depends what you want, you know. Depends on the sound. If I can only afford one pickup at a time, when I start with bridge humbucker or next single coil bridge and middle, I would probably leave the middle pickup and just replace the uh, probably the first the bridge pickup. That's the one that most people primarily play on, you know. It seems like, <clears throat> and then you know, and then do the next single coil. I like the Thornbucker, but you know, if you want something hotter, I, I would have probably a different recommendation. Thornbuckers are my my favorite. Uh, and let's see here. Ty came out two or three minutes later. It says, Jennifer, this is more about Doug. It said, sometimes Doug faints when he sings too hard. I could see that. Sometimes if I sing hard, I get lightheaded. So, and he is so amazing. So that kind of makes sense. He says, it came back shortly and asked for more AC. They went into Summerland and slayed it. Wow, that's great. So he triumphed and returned to the stage. Uh... And uh, Bruce says, it's so noisy stock, uh, talking about his pickups again. Um, yeah, I mean, you could try some no a noiseless neck single coil and then get a humbucker in the bridge. And either that or get the, you know, reverse wind, reverse polarity middle pickup, and then when you're in the two and four positions, it'll be hum canceling, if that makes sense. Uh, Andrea says, I'm using Melamu's IR1A convolution reverb and sometimes the sound goes away like the guitar chokes. Any possible solution? Are you using the, uh, the demo version? Because I know it mutes when every so often. If you, you have to buy it uh, in order to get the full version that doesn't mute. If it's not that, I had problems with that plugin. Pretty good plugin and I used it for years to host IRs. Uh, but I had issues with it at different sample rates and stuff, and it would all of a sudden everything would sound weird, and I'd be like, "What's going on?" And then I'd you know reboot or something, and it would sound normal. And I was like, "Eh." And so I, to tell you the truth, that's when I got the Mix uh, IR2 from Redwires, 
and uh, started using it, and it's I've had no problems with it. And I love actually in Mixire too the ability to blend different IRs and you know mix them easily. So I, I immediately kind of moved to that plugin and and have been using it ever since. So check it out if you're having issues. Uh, I think it's only. Uh, 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 50 bucks or something. It's not expensive. Okay. Um, which piece of my own playing am I the most proud of? Uh, probably stuff on this new record, I guess. Um, you know, stuff that's coming out. For stuff that's already out, I really love the... Uh, the... Uh, last song on Guitar Nerd, which is called Big Mistake. So I'm pretty proud of that. Just compositionally and stuff more than playing, I guess. But um, So there's some there's some kind of, you know, jerks in the chat right now and stuff, um, which sucks. So if you guys, you know, you guys can go and report people and stuff like that. <clears throat> Feel free to do that if it's bothering you. Or if you're like me, I just don't give a shit, you know. It's like haters. They're silly. It's, it's a sign of mental illness and nothing more, you know. So go, go ahead and go and report people and stuff like that if you guys want to. Or, like I said, just ignore. Who gives a shit, you know? Uh, my favorite delay. Um, too many to count. You know, I'm really enjoying using this new TC2290, um, the plug-in version that I have here. It's amazing, so for digital stuff. Uh... I love Echo Boy when I'm recording, which is a Sound Toys plugin. I wish they made it in a pedal. God, that's a good suggestion. I should hit up them and say, you guys should make an Echo Boy pedal. Uh, it does it kind of everything, and it sounds really amazing. So if, you, if you're a recording person, you got to try Echo Boy from Sound Toys. Amazing plugin, both the junior version and the regular version. For a pedal, uh, in other types of delays, <clears throat> I've got the Echoplex and the DD500 on my board right now. MXR Echoplex for tape stuff, which is great. Uh, and then the DD500. Um, I've used the Timeline for years as well, which is terrific. Um, I like all different kinds of delays. So the thing that when you use something like Echo Boy, you realize like you try all the different, like this tape delay, that tape delay, you know, Echo Plexes or Space Echoes or then the digital ones, you're like, God, I kind of like them all for different things. So it just depends on what you're doing. I mean, Memory Man's, Echo Plexes, Benson's, you know, I still love the El Cap for a, uh, a tape delay pedal. It's so easy to use. Uh, <clears throat> it's terrific. Terrific. Uh, Alrighty. Oh, there goes the chat. Jumping down. Maybe it's better if I kind of move to the end here anyway, guys. Uh, and um, go at it that way because I'm, I'm about an hour and 12 minutes in. i got to run relatively soon, probably in about 10 minutes, something like that. Michael Wagner, that is the guy I was trying to think of, and I'm sorry I couldn't remember his name. Michael Wagner, says Jim Maybury. He is the guy that uses, uh, he uses some kind of condenser mic blended with a dynamic. Okay, so I'm going to start there, because that was 10 or 15 minutes ago I was talking about that. So I'm going to move down in the chat from there. I'm sorry if I missed some questions. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see here. When will I upload part three, pedal board build part three? Well, if I can make that video this month, I wanted to make it as part of recording a song for the new record, but I'm running out of time to get everything done. That's all. So um, I had planned on, you know, it's when you're filming something like the pedal board built, uh, you know, video and trying to record a song at the same time, it's just so damn time consuming. And I'm just kind of running out of time. Uh, so I got, I got to get another pedal board video done, but because I said I'd do a third one. Would you, would you rather buy a Fender Deluxe Reverb 65 or 68? Uh, I like the 68 one. That new, if you're talking, you're talking about the new Fender versions, the 68 Silverface one, there's no bright cap on it. It's got the different channel one in it, and it seems like more of a kind of modern updated. I would get the 68 version out of those two. How about Michael Schenker? He's amazing. That was from Ramiro. I love uh, Michael Schenker. He's... He's, he's like the the European Eddie Van Halen. Uh, let's see. UA Aux with tube head versus Kemper for bedroom use. Both good. I have both. I don't know. Sorry. 
Like, I, it, you know, the tube amp and aux thing... Well, okay, so the only thing with the aux is that you can't use the effects and stuff like that through it. So if you're talking about attenuating an amplifier and trying to get effects and stuff like that, you're not going to be able to do that using the aux. Uh, you can't take advantage of the, the reverb and the delay in it and stuff like that and use it through a cabinet. You have to use it through studio monitors so um, or headphones. Uh, so in that instance, for the ultimate sort of low volume versatility, I would still say the Kemper for bedroom use is, is probably the way to go for that particular application. Uh, JTube says, things I bought because of you. A-type speaker, that's a good one. Petty John Chime, Petty John Gold. I hope you like it all. Uh, and then Andreas, I'm just seeing that question again about the Mellow Muse IR1A. So, um, yeah, I already answered that one. Uh, let's see here. Do I know if the Thornbucker covers can be desoldered? Sure, you can take them off if you want to try it. No cover. Good tech should be able to do that. Uh, and let's see. Planet Waves is all now getting branded as Diadario, isn't it? I don't know that actually. That could be. It's a good question. Maybe they maybe they're not using that name anymore. Um, I'm a long-time Ernie Ball string user, but I like the Adario strings. They're good, and uh, and their cables and all their accessories and stuff are fantastic. They sent me a, uh, a guitar. Here, let me show you guys this. Hold on a second. Check this out. This is great. This is like a, a thing that I got from them recently that's a, a kit, like a maintenance kit that has... Every tool you could possibly want, under the sun, uh, guitar fret polisher, you know, string winder, multi-tool, this is like nut lube stuff, one of their capos. This is like a little neck brace, so it's like you put, take this out and it folds out and holds, cradles the neck of the guitar, that kind of thing. So this is really cool. This is all this stuff that I'm looking for, like I can never find string winders or, uh, or you know, multi-tools, I always lose all that stuff. So to kind of have this and have this big, bigger thing that's in, all of it in one place, a little kit for guitar maintenance is pretty cool. So thank you, Diodario, that's nice stuff. Uh, what's the best $1,000 amp-ish, $1,000-ish amp for blues application, preferably not too loud? I would say, actually, just draw off the top of my head, that a thousand bucks, that 68 uh, Deluxe Reverb would be a, a nice amp for that. Um, it's, it's kind of what it's made for, I think, like clean to light overdrive, nice warm tones, clear, fendery, be a good amp for that. Uh, best overdrive pedal for Marshall, JCM 2000 DSL 100, I would probably hit it with a Klon or a Tube Screamer of some sort. So Archer, Tumnus, or one of the 8 million TS types. If you want a more hard rock thing, uh, uh, SD1, you know, Boss is a great sound for an amp like that. Which is not dissimilar to Tube, tube Screamer. Uh, Jam says he still has a Mesa Caliber 22, great little amp. Yeah, similar to the Caliber 50, probably the same front end, just a different power amp, I would think. They, they are cool. The Caliber 22s were, they, they had a different sound than all the other, like the Mark, uh, oh, 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 I forgot. So my other Mesa was a Mark III, and I hated that amp. Hated, with a passion. I mean, couldn't get a good sound. I would sit there. I remember sitting down at practice one time and still tweaking the damn thing like 45 minutes later, like trying to just get a sound. Like, you know, I'm going, I got to sell this amp. This amp is like, I can't get a tone out of it. And it's driving me crazy. So I got rid of that. But the Caliber 22 and the Caliber 50 were much simpler amps and they sounded really good. So similar era as well. You know, I got that Mark III thinking, oh, this will be the deluxe version of what I had before, and it was just not... I got, I got it in the mid-90s. I didn't like it at all. I think the probably that new Mark V, I've played through uh, Michael Thompson's Mark V Mini, you know, the 25 watt one. I quite liked it. thought it sounded pretty cool. So, uh, But I'm not an expert on the, on the Mesas. Uh, Brett says there's a 50 caliber somewhere locally for sale and you should check it out. Yeah, check it out. See what you think. I don't know. Maybe I'm off. You know, this is like a long time ago. So it's like it's, you know, 30 years ago. So, uh, 
maybe my ear for tone. I find generally though the tones I liked back then are similar to what I like now. So maybe it does sound good. Uh, what are my thoughts on the Synergy preamp modules? They're cool. I think it's a neat concept. I always like the Randall concept too. So um, you know, it's a neat way to to go. Uh, love the EP booster. Recently bought an SP comp. This is from Stephen Douglas. I like the SP comp a lot. Want to use my uh, amp gain, EP, and SP for a single tone. What order would you place them in? Put the EP booster last and the SP compressor first. Um, definitely. And then use the EP booster to just kind of drive the overall level going into your amp. Yeah, Mayron says, Celestians don't have the rear mics. Own Hammer does. Yes, that's right. I forgot uh, that, yeah, it was the Own Hammers I was using when I tried blending rear mics and I got some great sounds. Uh, on front and back mics, do you measure placement to equal distance? You should, yeah, I think so, like sort of similar. But the back mic is, it's such an anomaly. It's kind of like you have to flip the phase anyway. Um, and then like, it's hard to measure the distance because it's like, well, where's the sound exactly? Come, like, you don't want to stick it right in there, like right on. It's, it's kind of weird. I would say, yeah, try and like get it within relative, you know, if, if the, you're an inch and a half out from the front with the close, put the inch and a half in from the rear, but where do you mic? Because you've got the basket and all that stuff back there. So it's, I've never quite known what I'm doing, to be honest, when I do that. You'd, you'd be best to ask a, ask a real recording engineer when it comes to that. It's not something I've done a lot. Um, but I've done it a little bit and it does sound cool. Uh, when I've tried it. Just make sure you flip the phase and then you'll be in good shape. Otherwise, it'll sound real hollow and weird. Uh, okay. Any thoughts on lace sensor pickups? I, I had a guitar with them. I didn't really like them that much. Uh, <clears throat> what do I think about the Fender Jazzmaster? Like it. Always wanted one. Almost bought a 65 once. That was 1500 bucks. A real 65 Jazzmaster. It was the late 90s. It was an under the bed kind of condition and I didn't buy it and I just didn't quite have 1500 bucks right then to spend on a guitar and I was like shit and I, I didn't get it and I always regretted that because it was a great cool 65 jazz master I'd like an old one someday um, incidentally sir came out with a jazz master uh, with a real you know I know they've had their jam guitar for a couple of years now but they came out with one with jazz master style pickups in it that they made they made a new pickup that sounds really good and they put that mastery bridge on it uh, which is like jazz master style trim so it's a real kind of legit jazz master guitar uh, and the pickups are out of this world on those guitars it sounds so good uh, let's see here uh, Ringo says how do you get the sentry noise gate to work without closing down the noise floor don't you want it to close down the noise floor I run it last into a Fender bass breaker. Um, you just kind of have to play with them, you know? Like, I don't know how else to describe it. You just got to get... Uh, noise gates are a compromise. They're always a friggin' compromise to me. You roll down the volume on the guitar a bit, and then you need a different threshold setting, I feel like, on the gate. So, believe me, I struggle with it too. And I'm never that happy with gates. So, I don't know. Sometimes I just turn them off and live with the noise, because the, the chattery stuff bugs me. Which isn't any... It's not a... Uh, you know, any kind of indictment of the the, the Sentry. It's a, it's, it works as good as any of them, you know, and I quite I find it works quite well, actually. Um, I just find that they make it... It's really hard to get a gate to work with for because I use the volume control on the guitar a lot, so it's hard to get a gate to work for me all the way across the dynamic spectrum that I kind of want it to, if that makes sense. Um, you know, the loud humbucker. Okay, I got that set. Works fine. Switch to the next single coil. Now it's like, oh, it's cutting off the very tail of the notes, you know. Always an issue. Uh, Guitar Nerds Awesome says, Mike, any liner notes? Curious about your inspiration for Into the Ether. Also think of getting a Sir. Into the Ether was the only song on that record that I tracked entirely actually using the Axe effects. It's all modeling. And I was just trying to do a Gilmore thing, really. And I sort of, you know, I like mellow electronic music too, like kind of chill out music, because sometimes I like to hear no mid range and no guitar. And so there was that, you know, I got into using a certain drum kit in Logic that had, you know, a programmed beat that just sounded really chilled out to me and I liked it. And then I just kind of started writing this really that kind of melody that the song has. Um, and I just sort of built the song from there. 
with all this air and space and it's very stony and you know just kind of wanted to do something like that uh, what UAD plugins would you recommend for starting out on the Apollo Twin? Oh, I already kind of answered that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any experience using a JCM 800? Yes, quite a bit. Um, don't negate the low gain input. Always try it for clean stuff with pedals. It sounds amazing. Great clean sounds to be had out of JCM 800s using the low gain input. And beyond that, my only other recommendation is if you can't get it up loud, the bright cap is annoying, so you might want to clip the bright cap on the volume control, the little cap that makes it aggressively teethy. But as soon as you get the amp with the gain up above five or six, you know, seven, and then if you can run the master on at least three, now it starts to sound great, and, um, and the bright cap makes sense then. So it's when you're trying to use it for higher gain sounds at really, or, or mid gain sounds at low volume, it just sounds too teethy many times. So. The amp's meant to be kind of used loud, I find. Um, that bright cap, though, can be really nice for the clean sounds. If you're you know, using the low gain input and you want some clarity, then so it's a, it's a compromise. It just depends how you use the amp, mostly. Are vintage solid state amps worthless? Not if you can get a good sound out of them. I mean, they're probably all cheap at this point, you know, but if, if you know, uh, just keep in mind Ty Tabor used the Lab Series solid state amp for that iconic, amazing guitar tone he got on the first few King's X records. Uh, the Randall RG amps have kind of a cool tone. Uh, kind of cool. Digging France says, uh, saw Soundgarden in Dublin about seven years ago. Were you there? No, I wasn't, but uh, I played in Dublin with Chris about nine years ago. Uh, we played a theater in Dublin. I remember, I remember it well. Because I wanted to take a shower and the hot water wasn't working in the theater. So I took the last cold shower I've ever taken in that theater in Dublin. I screamed like a baby. So friggin' cold. Uh, let's see. Uh, do I think I would have been as musically successful living in SoCal versus Canada? Born and raised in SoCal, but have a musical opportunity in Seattle. Not sure if it's wise to move. You know, man, I've been thinking a lot lately about LA. And I think largely, there's still opportunities here and uh, auditioning for gigs and things like that, that happens here. And you kind of have to be in LA to do that stuff. But many, many, many of the things that were the reason that I moved here have gone away, I would say. It's still this us music center, you know, and but it's not the same as it was in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. It's not as, there's not as much sessions going on. There's not as much, there's still, maybe I'd move somewhere else and I'd be like, oh, there's more going on there than I, than I realized I missed it. But there's not as much rock and roll guitar happening in LA anymore. It's just not. It's like there's, yeah, sure, there's tours that go out of here and stuff like that. It's pop tours mainly, you know, I feel like. There's just not a hell of a lot of rock and roll happening. Um, you can go out to clubs here and you see it. There's just not the, it's not the same, you know, as it, as it used to be. So, um, hard to say. And then with the advent of the internet and stuff, which is how most of you guys know me, is more from that than, you know, I mean, like, not a lot of people know, but I mean, it's like I had a touring career from like 96 or 97 all the way through 2010, which is when this YouTube thing really picked up. But I was touring and working constantly in bands, always on the road and always on tour and stuff like that. For that, I needed to be in L.A. because it was like nobody knew me on the Internet. There was no other, you know, I didn't have a solo album out. I wasn't like a solo artist. I was just a, another working guitar player. And f so I had to go audition and get the gigs in L.A., um, had to be in LA to do that stuff. Now it's like nine people out of ten, if they know my name, they know it from this stuff, from YouTube and from Instagram and from videos. And and for that, I could be anywhere, you know. So it depends what aspect of a career, you know. I think you can be like like I wonder if Leo's in the chat. He's probably not because I haven't seen him. But Leo from uh, Frog Leap Studios is a guy who has an incredible music career right now, living in the fjords of Norway. So he's he's the ultimate, you know, best example I can give you of someone that's that's made a great music career and they're living somewhere else. Now he also did other stuff before the YouTube thing and what he's doing now. He's you know obviously a talented player and producer, 
songwriter and stuff like that, but he's really, you know, utilized the modern sort of technology to, to, to take it to the hilt. Um, so I don't know if it matters as much anymore living in, uh, in, uh, in L.A. Will there ever be a Sir PT90 pickup? Is that like a, like a P90? That's an interesting idea. I'm not really a P90 guy so much. I mean, I love them. It's weird. I, gotta, I have one guitar with P90s, which is my Mac Mull, which is killer. God, it's a good sounding guitar. Um, but, when, and I should probably, you know, I, just, I don't know. It's like, should probably get into it more using P90s because I, I do dig it. I love that fat single coil thing. Seems like a no-brainer for me. Maybe I'll try and, you know, play P90s more. What player is the best live sound I've heard of any style? Oh, man. I don't know. Landau, probably. Like, yeah. Let's go with Mike. I mean, it's not really a sound, it's him, it's the overall, it's the whole package, but he, it's the closest thing that I can say to going to see somebody like Hendrix, where you're like enveloped in guitar and just like have your, it's like a, uh, like a paradigm shift going to see Lando, like, like remembers, uh, it'll remind you of why you love guitar, you know, and you'll walk out going, oh my God, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Uh, but it's in his hands, mainly. Yeah. Jennifer says that, uh, Doug's amazing and that Rudy, Rudy Sarzo is also 67. Here's to clean living. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's clean living as well as, uh, uh, rock and roll and doing something different every day, you know? Playing music will keep you young to a certain degree, I think, if you live clean enough, because not having to do the same thing over and over again and get bored with your life, you know, a, a, touring and being, it can be taxing, but it'd also be great, like playing in a different city on different days. I was thinking about that when we were watching King's X the other day. Those guys play as good as they ever did, and you see Jerry up there, and he's not a young man, you know. Uh, but playing music in front of people, it's a great... It's a great. I mean, also a lot of you know a lot of rockers die pretty young, but um, I don't know. Certainly, <clears throat> it's like Jimmy Page said. You know, in it might get loud. He said, well, "Every moment we were on stage was totally living." I like that quote. You know, that's what it feels like. You're playing music. You're in it. You're present. Being present. You know, uh, and you're not wishing you were somewhere else. If you are, then that sucks. <laughs> Uh, righty. What's it like being friends with builders like Dave Friedman and Sir? It's awesome because they're all just guitar nerds, you know, just like me. There's just people that don't know about about doing anything different. They've been they've been doing the, the they're enveloped in it, and it's like this is what they do. I mean, not to say they're one dimensional people or something. They're not. John's got all kinds of interests, and Dave's got other interests and stuff like that. But it's like they're they're just you know they're, they're kindred spirits, right? Um, that just geek out on uh, on the same stuff. They just went a different path with it to the building path. Like maybe I'm more interested in building things than actually playing for a living, you know. And I get that. It's like I don't have those skills as a. John's got an amazing mind, and Dave's a wealth of knowledge, and you know they they've got. Uh, it's smart, you know, to take the path like where you're like, oh, I think maybe my thing is amp building, or I think maybe my thing is rig building, or guitar building, or whatever, and. Uh, you know, recognizing that you, I, I remember hearing Andy, uh, what's his name, Andy Brower, the, you know, he had a legendary, you know, studio rental company and stuff like that, realizing that he liked guitars and the gear more than playing, that he liked the, being around all that stuff, and so he said, I'm going to start a rental company, and he had the most successful, you know, uh, guitar and amp rental company that used to rent all the studios and stuff in the sort of studio heyday in L.A., you needed a vintage Marshall, you needed an old Strat for a session or something, you rented it from Brower's. And incidentally, Friedman used to work for Brower. Um, so it's just kind of interesting. But I remember Andy saying he realized his calling was the guitars and the amps and stuff, not necessarily playing. So he went down that road and he had a very a cool, successful business doing that. So that's really smart. Uh, you should tour the new record and combine it with home studio recording master class and clinics. I would love to do that. At, uh, we'll see in the fall. You know, maybe there, maybe there's something there, like combined with Sir or something, where I could play some stuff from the record and then talk about maybe how I recorded some of the songs or something. That, that's a cool idea. 
Uh, Mac G says G1265 in an open back 212 is pretty cool. I agree. I like it. I have one sitting right here actually, two G1265s in a hedgehog cabinet. It's a great sound for that kind of think Robin Ford. Uh, very cool. Uh, Revival Drive can, this is from Oscillation Overdrive, can you use it as a uh, pedal with driver boost before it? Yes, you can totally use it like that. Um, I would say you could put a boost pedal after it and put a drive pedal in front of it and that would probably be a cool setup because then you could get a solo boost. Uh, with more volume and then more gain with a you know tube screamer or maybe clon type in front something like that uh, gotta go soon guys gotta get out of here and move along with the day but uh, this has been fun yeah oh, that's a good question just kind of reminiscing Tony says any thoughts on Ibanez blazer guitars they were cool you're talking about the vintage ones right I, I got a like soft spot for that old Ibanez stuff um, uh, I love the old Ibanez guitars from the early 80s. They were cool. Anybody remember the Lukather one? Like where he's, it's blue with the, the kind of the knobs with the little rubber things on them and stuff. And it was like a blue sunburst strat. I always loved the look of that guitar. It was like, I don't know if he actually used it or not, but he was in ads with this blue Ibanez that looked good. It had a flame top on it. I don't know. I just remember thinking it was really cool looking. Frank's asking about the Pedalboard Part 3 build again video. I don't know if I'm going to get to it before I go to Japan. I can try, but I don't know. Maybe I'll film some stuff. Maybe I'll film some stuff with it if I can. And then I also, my intention was to kind of, while I'm on tour, so show, like in rehearsals and stuff, how I use the pedal board with the amp and the setup and stuff. Maybe film, film some stuff in rehearsals. So maybe I'll try and do that. And then, and then I can take it to Japan and, you know, the video I have and then edit it into something that works. Uh... Okay, a couple more questions, then I gotta go, you guys. Um, so let's see. Uh, how do you finger a D minor nine chord at the fifth fret? Timu says. I guess you could go like um, like that, right? So you're playing the nine there on the third string. Lots of close voicing stuff going on there, but that would kind of be the only way to do it, I guess. Right? And then the other way to do it would be at the 10th fret, playing the E on top up there with your pinky. Yep. And you could get grab the bass with your thumb, maybe. Uh, Alright, let's see here. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. A couple more questions. I'm going to go all the way to the end here. And, um, and, uh, and get out of here. Somebody's talking about problems with their hands. Kenny Roberts starts with a burning feeling. Maybe t tendonitis or something. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure what the question is. I'm looking through here, but I can't find it. Uh, Burning inflammation, pain, lack of mobility, and dexterity. Sounds not good. Sounds like take a break and use ibuprofen. And I know problems with tendonitis and stuff are such a drag. Um, what was Chris Cornell's favorite guitar? Um, that will be my last uh, question, I think, because I got to run, you guys. Um, let me take it one more, two first. Uh, uh, have I ever run across any overdrives that blew me away from the start? The the ones that I remember are like the, the uh, you know, like Klons, I just bonded with that tone, Klon types. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, Friedman's BE really knocked me out. And the first time I plugged it in for the modded Plexi thing, as well as the Plexi tone, I loved it right away. Um, so those are a few. And the LaGrange I really liked right from the start. Okay, last question. Um, uh, Cornell's favorite guitars. He had an old telly that he really liked. Um, it was like a 52. And then he had um, a Gretsch, you know, that, that he used a lot, the black one that, that he really liked. And then another guitar that he really seemed to have an affinity uh, as kind of a sentimental thing for was the Neil Young Les Paul that he had. It was like a recreation of, of Neil Young's, you know, black, old black Les Paul. Uh, 
and he had that guitar and the headstock had been broken on it and he had it fixed and he still used it a lot and he really I, he, I remember him showing me that guitar and he really dug it um, as far as the other ones those are the main ones that come to mind and then he, he really liked his you know signature Gibson that I have a great memory of sitting you know with him in his little home studio which he built in the bedroom and we're you know sitting like on the edge of the bed and he had the the, the, you know, he'd just gotten them, like a red one and a green one, I think. It was red or black, I can't remember, but he had the green one there and he was showing it to me and I was checking it out and stuff. I had a great big neck on it and kind of high action with the Bigsby and stuff. That's the way he liked it, he, you know. But, uh, yeah, I remember sitting there and helping him with some, some of the home studio stuff, but setting it up because he had all the same stuff as, as I did with the Atom monitors and the same setup and stuff. We were sitting there and he was going to check this out. I got my new guitar. And, uh, you know, so he had a, a a real good association, I think, with Gibson there and building that guitar, and he was real happy with them and the way that they came out. So, anyway, uh, all right, you guys, um, have a good rest of your Sunday, and I'm gonna jet. I'll see you next week. Thanks for uh, tuning in and uh, and for being uh, so cool. Great questions. I'm sorry I missed any of your questions. I really apologize, and um, hope you have a great rest of your weekend, and hopefully I'll have some album news and this time next week I better be finished at least with tracking and then a week after that I better be done with mixing and have the stuff off for mastering and to get the CDs made so album will be real soon and uh, we'll see ya alright <laughs>